Hello and welcome to the Carlton Academy's Year 10 lesson on policies towards the church in Nazi Germany. You should have already completed the starter activity with your teacher on Teams. If you haven't, you need to go back and make sure that you've at least put your name for the register and then we're going to make a start on the actual lesson here on YouTube. Now remember in the last five minutes of the lesson at least you'll need to go back and see your teacher so that they can go through some of the really key points with you. So title for today if you haven't already put it down is how successful um, was the Nazi coordination of the churches. So if you can just pause the video and write that down if you haven't already. OK, so today we are going to be thinking about their policies towards both the Catholics and the Protestants. It's important that you know the difference between them and how the Nazi treatment of them differed as well. So we're aiming as a minimum to be able to describe in detail the Nazi policies towards them. Grades five to six is if you can explain the policies and what impact they had. And grades seven to nine is if you can make a reasoned judgment of the conclusion about to what extent the Nazis were successful in their policies to try and coordinate the Christian churches. To start with, I just want to talk to you about Hitler's views on Christianity. Now, you don't have to make any notes on this, but it's interesting to see what he truly thought about Christianity. Now, Hitler was very careful not to share his views out in the open with the German people because he didn't want to offend them. But this is what he thought, which we can tell from a private conversation he had when he first came to power in 1933. He said that Catholic and Protestant, they are both the same. Neither of them has any future left. That won't stop me stamping out Christianity in Germany, root and branch. One is either a Christian or a German. You can't be both. So even though the majority of the people in Germany were Christian, Hitler very much felt that people should be loyal to him above all else and loyal to the Nazi state rather than to their religion. So that's what he must have truly thought about religion as he's saying that in a private conversation. Let's move on to looking at the religious divide in Germany. So as you can see, we've got a breakdown here of the different religions in Germany. Now, almost all Germans at this point were Christian. Less than 1% of the population, about 500,000 people were Jewish, but the majority of people were Christian, even though they belonged to different denominations. Now, at this point, a third of the population of Germany is Roman Catholic. Now, Roman Catholics, if you don't know, are people that follow the direction of the Pope and the Catholic Church, um, and they tend to be a little bit more strict in their ideas. Um, for instance, really kind of hardened um, Roman Catholics don't believe in things like contraception. Um, but at this time as well, there were two thirds of people in Germany that were Protestant. Protestants are a group of Christians that emerged after the Roman Catholic Church, after something called the Reformation that was happening in the 14 and 1500s. And basically, this was when people were fed up with the Catholic Church and they wanted, for instance, to worship God in more simple churches without the kind of grand decorations that you tend to find in Roman Catholic churches. So two thirds of the German population were Protestant. So all I want you to do now is pause the video here and copy down these notes under a new subheading of religion in Germany. OK, so next we're going to talk about the aims of Hitler's policies towards the churches. And once I've talked through all of this, you can pause the video and make some notes about Hitler's aims and the difficulties he faced. Now, we know already that Hitler wanted to try and destroy Christianity root and branch. We've heard that already from his private conversation he had in 1933. But he's got to be quite careful and he can't go in straight away and just try and destroy the church because religion is really important to the majority of people in Germany. So he's got to be very careful and tactical about how he does this. So first of all, he wants to begin with trying to gain control over the churches and then over time he hopes to try and weaken their influence. Now the reason that he wants to try and control them is because the churches are a potential obstacle to his reordering of the German people into committed followers of his totalitarian regime. Remember, a totalitarian regime is one where one person is basically in control and has the power. 
So the Nazis wanted to try and destroy it from the beginning, but they were essentially torn between a policy of total suppression, which would alienate most of the German people. And remember that Hitler isn't, um, you know, he hasn't got the support of every single German in 1933. You know, he only got 44 percent of the vote in the March 1933 elections. He still got to try and win round the other people as well. So he's torn between this policy of total suppression that he can't do at the beginning and limited suppression, which would allow them too much independence. So he's got to try in his mind strike the right balance of destroying Christianity, but doing it in a very careful way so that he doesn't alienate his followers. And he is very clever about the way he deals with this. We're going to see, for instance, with the Catholic Church, that at first he does some deals with them called the Concordat in July 1933 basically are in agreement where the church will leave the Nazis alone. In return, the Nazis will leave Catholic youth groups and schools and things alone. So pause the video here and make some notes about Hitler's aims and the difficulty he faced in trying to achieve that. Next, I'm going to ask you to watch this brief clip, which is going to introduce you to the policies towards the church and the resistance. It's not very detailed, it doesn't go into any great depth, but it will give you a little bit of an overview of what it was like in terms of their religious policies and some of the opposition that they faced. You can make some bullet pointed notes if you want to, but you don't have to. We will be covering the key information from this in the later part of the lesson. It's still worth watching though, because it will give you a sense and an introduction to what we are going to be doing later on in this lesson. Reck was a Christian. His opposition to the Nazis was less political than religious. He feared the Nazis meant to destroy Christianity. He was right. They were busy inventing their own religion, not one that protected the weak, but one that admired strength. I saw a Hitler youth boy recently. He was in a classroom and suddenly he noticed a crucifix hanging behind the teacher's desk and his face twisted in fury and he ripped down this symbol which hangs in every church in Germany and he threw it to the ground with the cry, lie there you dirty Jew. The Christian churches might have led ordinary Germans against the Nazis, but like the outlawed political parties, they failed. Hitler had made idle promises that he'd protect the church. The Pope, the Catholic bishops, and... Reck was a Christian. His opposition to the Nazis was less political than religious. He feared the Nazis meant to destroy Christianity. He was right. They were busy inventing their own religion, not one that protected the weak, but one that admired strength. I saw a Hitler youth boy recently. He was in a classroom and suddenly he noticed a crucifix hanging behind the teacher's desk and his face twisted in fury and he ripped down this symbol which hangs in every church in Germany and he threw it to the ground with the cry lie there you dirty Jew the Christian churches might have led ordinary Germans against the Nazis but like the outlawed political parties they failed Hitler had made idle promises that he'd protect the church. So you need to know about the differences between how Hitler treated the Catholics and the Protestants. Now, first of all, we're going to do some work on the Catholics and then we'll move on to the Protestants after. So if you could put a nice big title or subheading of Hitler and the Catholics, just so your notes are really clear and easy to revise from. Now, all you need to do, first of all, is to put this bit that I've put in red here on this slide. So you just need to write down underneath that at first Hitler tried to control the Catholics 
by reassuring them and encouraging them to work with the Nazi government. Now that's what he does from 1933, as we can see in this picture here of some of the leading Nazis signing an agreement with the Catholic Church in July 1933. And this is something called the Concordat that I'll talk more about in a second. Essentially, this is where Hitler allowed the churches to continue with their youth groups in schools in return for the church staying out of politics. Remember that the Catholics had a party called the Centre Party at this point, and they allow him to pass things like the Enabling Act in March 1933. Remember, that's the law that allows him to pass whatever laws he wants for the next four years. OK, so just pause it here and just write down that bit in red that we can see there. OK, so now we've got the really important information that we need to know about the policies towards the Catholic Church. And we need to understand how it changes over time. So I've done your notes this time in the form of a timeline. And as I'm talking through it, I want you to listen carefully. And once I've talked through it, I then like you to make some notes about this. You might do it as a flow diagram or a timeline, something like that. OK, so first of all, the Nazis found it much harder to deal with the Catholics than they did the Protestants. This is because the Catholics are influenced by the Pope and therefore there's a foreign influence because obviously the Pope lives in the Vatican um, in Rome. So July 1933, they signed the Concordat. This is where the Catholics compromised with the Nazis, just like I talked about on the last slide, where they agreed to stay out of politics in return the Nazis agreed to leave the Catholic youth groups and schools alone. Now in 1935, Hitler breaks his promise. He often can't be trusted. And instead of leaving them alone, he ends up attacking Christian schools. He does things like saying that they're not allowed any crucifixes in them, which really upsets the Catholics. And in 1936, if you remember from when we did the youth, Hitler made the Hitler Youth the only youth group and he banned all other youth organisations. So he's gone against that Concordat promise from July 1933 and he's upset the Catholics. Now the Catholics respond by criticising the Nazis publicly. Hitler then starts arresting Catholic bishops that have cr criticised the Nazis. And in 1937, the Pope writes a letter because he's really angry at the fact that innocent Catholic bishops have been arrested for just criticising the Nazis. So he writes a letter called With Burning Concern, or sometimes known as With Burning Grief, where he criticises the Nazis in it. And the idea is that that letter is supposed to be read out in all the pulpits across Germany's churches. Now, the Pope did that to try and scare Hitler off and to stop him um, arresting different Catholic priests. But instead, Hitler just responds with more repression, more arrests. He does things like closing down some of the monasteries. He starts spying on the church leaders. He closed down all Catholic schools. So the church can't really do anything more than criticising him. And Hitler has managed to just silence them, essentially, with increased repression. Now, generally, the Catholic opposition to the Nazis isn't very effective, but we do get a very successful man in 1941, somebody called von Galen, who is a Catholic priest. Now, from 1939, the Nazis had been carrying out this absolutely horrendous policy of murdering innocent, disabled children and adults. So they began a policy of euthanasia, which they talked about as being mercy killings, where they were executing people that were really ill. And this is the origin of the Holocaust. They start using gas on disabled people and then apply it to Jewish people later on during the Second World War. Now, when von Galen finds out about this policy two years in, because obviously the Nazis have tried to do this in secret because they don't want to upset the German public. Von Galen finds out and starts, starts preaching publicly about this and saying how horrendous it is. And as a result, because the war is going on and because the Nazis need a lot of support during the war, they actually temporarily stop the killings because they don't want to lose support at that point. So generally, the Catholic opposition isn't all that successful because the Nazis just respond with increased repression. There is that example of 1941, a Catholic minister, von Galen, going up against the Nazis and criticising their policy of euthanasia. And that is successful. So generally, there was some resistance from the Catholic Church to the Nazis. However, the large majority of it was just about protecting themselves and their independence of their organisations. 
When they stood up to the Nazis, it was normally about things like their youth groups being banned or their schools being threatened. It often wasn't about supporting people generally and about saying that the Nazis were wrong for Germany. For instance, there is no comment from any Catholics en masse about the treatment of the Jewish people. So the Catholics did have some kind of resistance to Nazis. But generally, at first, at least in those initial years between 1933 and 1935, they did cooperate, cooperate and compromise with the Nazis. So pause the video here and copy out this timeline. So you've now got the key notes about the Nazis and their policies to do with the Catholic Church. What I'd like you to do is in a second to pause the video, think about that question and then write an answer about it underneath your timeline. So how successful were the Nazis with regards to the Catholic Church? So pause it here and then write down your ideas. If you're really stuck, you can always message your teacher on Teams and they'll help you. So you're now done with your information on the Catholics. What you're gonna look at now is what their policies were like to do with the Protestant Church. So just like you did a nice big subheading or title on the Catholics, I'd like you this time to write a nice um, big subheading of Hitler and the Protestants. And then underneath that, you're gonna be making some notes about why Hitler found it easier to control the Protestant Church. So listen to me talk through this information and then you're going to answer this question that's written at the bottom in red afterwards. Now, first of all, we've already seen that the Catholic Church was much harder to control because they listened to somebody that was foreign. They listened to the Pope um, and obviously the Nazis found it very difficult to control the Pope because he's not living in Germany. The Protestant Church, however, wasn't anything like the Catholics. They weren't one unified and united church. The Protestant Church, as it's known, was actually made up of 28 different branches. So it was very divided in comparison to the Catholics. So first of all, Hitler found it easy to control the Protestant Church because they are divided and they don't have a foreign leader. Second of all, the people that supported the Nazis were actually often Protestant. So most of Hitler's supporters from the 1932 election, remember he gets 37% of the vote or 230 seats, most of them are actually Protestants. We know that because there were lots of Protestants that lived in the north and east of Germany, and that's where the majority of people voted for the Nazis. So why did lots of Protestants support the Nazis then? Well, lots of them held quite nationalist views and lots of them were anti-communist. And therefore, there were some points of agreement between their ideas and the Nazi ideas. Obviously, not every single um, Protestant was a Nazi supporter. We're just saying that the majority of the support for the Nazis came from people that also happened to be Protestant. So if you could please answer this question at the bottom, why did Hitler find it easier to control the Protestant church and include both of those reasons in your answer? So we've mentioned that the Protestants were easier to control. Now they created their own Protestant church at this point, which they called the Reich Church. So underneath a subheading of the Reich Church, you're going to make some notes using this information that we've got on the slide here. So I'm gonna talk through it and then you can make your notes afterwards and pause it once I'm done. So in 1933, the year that the Nazis came to power, remember that Hitler has made Chancellor on the 30th of January, 1933. Straight away, they try and create the Reich Church. The word Reich, by the way, means the empire, essentially, because remember that Hitler wanted to create the thousand year Reich, the thousand year empire, essentially. So the Nazis took those 28 different branches of the Protestant Church and they combined them all together into one unified national church, the Reich Church. This meant that effectively the Protestant Church had become a state institution and therefore they had to follow the rules that the Nazis put in place. For instance, the Nazis had a rule called the Aryan Paragraph and this is where they said all the people in the church who were Christians now, but people that had previously converted from Judaism, they were now to be expelled from the church. So the right church then listens to them and gets rid of all those people that have converted from being uh, Jewish to being Christian. 
They also, in their churches, now that they've got the right church, have big swastikas that are put up. In some places, they even have images of Hitler in the church. And the church leaders would start their um, services with a Heil Hitler greeting. We can see here an image of um, a wedding that's going on just uh, inside the church where they're just walking out of the church doors. And you can see that they've got things like swastikas around. You know, even the man is getting married in his SA um, or SS uniform. So there are lots of um, quite shocking things when you look at photos of the Reich Church to see the blending of Christianity, you know, being taken by the Nazis and, and changed into something that um, kind of suited their, their policies and suited this idea of the Nazi state being everywhere. It's quite shocking to see. But generally, it was pretty successful and they didn't face that much opposition from most of the Protestants. Remember that two thirds of the German population are Protestant at this point. So what I'd like you to do is put a new subheading down of the right church, pause it here and make some notes using that information. So we mentioned that the majority of the people didn't go against the Nazi policy of coordinating the church and creating their own Nazified church called the Reich Church. However, there were some people that were incredibly upset about this, including people called Niemöller and Bonhoeffer. Now, these are two names that I really want you to make sure that you know, because they are really key individuals that resist the Nazi state. Just like von Galen did for the Catholics, these are the important people to know for Protestant resistance. And we will come back to these in a future lesson. After we've studied the Holocaust, we'll be looking at opposition and we'll be coming back to these names. So there were lots of church leaders that were outraged by the Reich Church and the fact that the Nazis now controlled it. So they decided to create their own opposition church, something called the Confessional Church. Now, of 17,000 people that were Protestant leaders at this point, 5,000 of them joined this church. So it's quite significant here from the Protestant leaders that 5,000 out of 17,000 joined this new church, which has been made in opposition to the Nazis. Now, the Nazis didn't like this. They hated the fact that there was people rebelling against them and going against their policy. So just like they do when the Catholics go against them, they respond with increased repression. And by 1937, 700 of the Protestant leaders had been imprisoned. Niemöller and Bonhoeffer, two of the people that set up this uh, confessional church, were also arrested. Now, Niemöller was put in a concentration camp for seven years and Bonhoeffer was arrested as well. But he was eventually murdered and didn't survive the Second World War. Now, in the video that you watched earlier, it actually read out a very famous poem by Niemöller. And when you studied the Holocaust in year eight, your teacher probably told you about this poem and might have read it out to you at some point. I think this is a really poignant poem and a really good piece of opposition, something that has been shared by a lot of people now and people use it when they try and remember the Holocaust and the horrors of it. And I think it shows you about the, the kind of the negatives of being quiet in the face of terrible policies as well. So this is what Niemöller said. First, they came for the socialists. And I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. And they came for the train, trade unionists. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And they came for the Jews. And I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak for me. So I think this shows the real horrors of the Holocaust and the policies of, um, of the Nazis and the way that they dealt with opposition, that they crushed it so brutally. So what I'd like you to do now is to make some notes using this information on this slide about the type and extent of opposition from the Protestants. So pause it here to be able to complete that. So now you've done that, I'd like you to put some notes down or an answer to this question. How successful were the Nazis at controlling the Protestant church? So think about the general masses and what went on with the Reich church. And then also think about what some of the Protestant leaders did with the confessional church. So pause the video here to be able to complete that.
Now that you've done that, you've actually come to the end of the lesson. Now, this is just the end of the YouTube clip, not the end of the full lesson itself, because remember that we do the plenary on Teams. So what you need to do is go back to Teams. If it's actually before the end of the lesson and you finished maybe a little bit early, then you can still message your teacher on Teams and ask for what the plenary task is. And you can make a start on it while you're waiting for the other students to catch up. If it is five minutes before the lesson, that's perfect timing. And that means that you can then um, complete the plenary live with your teacher straight away. Well done for getting to the end of the work. Make sure you keep your notes safe.